In a courtroom in 1991, the murderer sat unresponsive as witnesses described what he'd done. There was the gunshot in the middle of the afternoon, and the dead girl's legs had splayed out of her front door, twitching. Why? Why? She's screaming. She's just straight screaming. Why? Why? The murderer's face didn't change as the experts explained he was legally insane. His lawyers then queued up the song that they said drove him to commit the crime. And when the lyrics started, the killer lit up. His lips began to move along with the words, and when the drums finally kicked in, the killer beat out the rhythm on his knees with a grin on his face. And this story gets even creepier though. But before we get into it, if you're like me and obsessed with music history, mystery, and misadventure, then bang on that subscribe button because that's all you're gonna get here at this channel. Be sure to turn on all notifications so you never miss any of our weekly uploads or daily shorts. All right, I'm Jake Brennan, this is Disgraceland, and three, two, rock a roll In 1987, U2 were the biggest rock band on the planet. In their fifth studio album, The Joshua Tree, it was a huge international success. It topped the charts in over 20 countries, it became the fastest selling album in British history at the time. It won over countless critics and it won major awards. It skyrocketed the band to superstardom. But despite all these accolades, The Joshua Tree also quickly became a source of great pain for U2 and not for reasons you may think. Because U2's Joshua Tree, that album, it inspired a man to commit a grisly murder. The last thing that Bono, U2's lead singer, the last thing he wanted was for his band or his songs to be associated with murder. When people think of Bono, they think of a larger than life front man with tinted wraparound sunglasses delivering big rock and roll sermons at football stadiums, or maybe they just think of the guy who snuck an album onto your iTunes account without your permission, but Back in 1987, Bono was the leading voice of politically charged rock and roll. And even before a U2 song was inextricably linked to a horrific true crime, their music had already nearly gotten Bono and his band killed. On the morning of November 8th, 1987, hours before U2 took the stage in Denver, back in their home country in Ireland, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, bombed a parade in a small town in Northern Ireland and killed 11 people. And throughout U2's tour, fans mistakenly assumed that the band was sympathetic to and maybe even affiliated with the IRA. People threw cash on stage at shows, hoping that it would find its way back to Ireland to buy guns and bombs for the cause. And the one time U2 tried to address Ireland's violent civil rights protests in their work with the 1983 hit, the excellent Sunday Bloody Sunday, the band missed their mark. People were confused by the song. Half thought the song was in support of the IRA, and half thought it was a rebuke of the IRA. And most Irish men and women weren't happy about the song either way. By the time 1987 rolled around, with U2 being the biggest rock band in the world, and they were the most recognizable exports of their troubled homeland in Ireland. If U2 weren't going to say anything about the state of Ireland, about the violent conflict that had led to countless deaths, then people were going to read whatever they wanted into U2's silence. But the band also lived in Dublin, a city where speaking out against the IRA at the time could get you killed. And that night, November 8th, 1997, U2 held a meeting before their show in Denver. And they weighed the risks of speaking out on stage on Ireland's troubles and decided that they couldn't be quiet anymore. So on stage in the middle of their performance of Sunday Bloody Sunday, Bono let the crowd know exactly where he stood. What's the glory in taking a man from his bed and gunning him down in front of his wife and his children? Where's the glory in that? No more, say, no more, no more, no more, no more. And the next day, the death threats started pouring in. When you two got back to Dublin, the local police brought the band in to get their fingerprints on file, and their toe prints too. 
Not because Bono, The Edge, Adam Clayton, or Larry Mullen Jr. had done anything wrong. They were taking their fingerprints so that if their mutilated body showed up as the result of an IRA bomb, then they could be identified. It was a precaution because now that U2 had spoken out, the threat to U2 from the IRA was very legitimate. And the band lived under the threat of violence until the Good Friday Agreement a decade later in 1998. In that agreement, it brought the so-called troubles in Northern Ireland to an end. But the band knew they'd made the right decision back in 1987 when they spoke out, essentially, against the IRA. No one could say that U2 supported murder. However, a year later, in Los Angeles, U2 would indeed be blamed for inspiring a murder. Robert John Bardo was a bright kid with serious mental health problems. His father was an alcoholic, and his mother suffered from mental illness. And when Robert's own bipolar disorder played havoc with his teenage brain, no one in the family had the capacity to get him help. He was institutionalized when he was just 15, and he started to show progress, but his family pulled him out after a month. He dropped out of high school, and ended up working as a janitor at a jack-in-the-box in Tucson, Arizona, where he lived with his parents at his parents' place. And Robert John Bardo was also obsessed. He became obsessed with a sitcom called My Sister Sam in the summer of 1986, when he was 16. He was mostly obsessed with the show's spunky teenager, played by actress Rebecca Schaefer. Robert wrote her letters and he sent her drawings. And like her character in the show, Rebecca Schaefer was maybe a little too sweet and maybe a little too naive for her own good. But maybe she hadn't noticed how frequently Robert was writing to her. She was a teen star, a regular on the cover of Seventeen Magazine and Teen Beat. And she was flooded with fan mail and the names at the bottom of the letters didn't really matter. So, in 1987, Rebecca Schaefer responded to one of Robert John Bardo's letters. She said his letter was the nicest letter she ever received. And that little note, it meant everything to Robert. It meant he hadn't been imagining the connection that he felt to Rebecca. So, as soon as he could, he got on a flight from Tucson to Los Angeles. Robert showed up at the gates of Burbank Studios with a five-foot-tall stuffed rabbit and a bouquet of flowers, and he insisted that he had to see Rebecca Schaefer. Instead, he saw the head of security, who sent Robert packing back to Tucson. A few months later, my sister Sam was canceled. But without Rebecca's weekly televised visits to his living room, Robert John Bardo's obsession with her started to fade. So, he shifted his attention to pop star Debbie Gibson. He even took a bus to New York to try to find Debbie. As you can guess, that did not work out. But while in New York, Robert did pay a visit to the Dakota Building, the New York City apartment building where Mark David Chapman assassinated John Lennon. Robert sat on the pavement out front of the building and read The Catcher in the Rye, the same book Mark David Chapman carried with him when he shot Beetle John. The same book John Hinckley Jr., the man who tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan to impress Jodie Foster, the same book that he carried with him. Robert John Bardo read this book because Robert John Bardo was becoming a student of stalkers and killers. If you're into this story, it means you're a fan of music history, mystery, and misadventure, just like I am. And of course, that means we're all in the right place. So like this video, subscribe to the channel, turn on all your notifications so you never miss an upload. All right, let's get back into the story. Sometime in the early 80s, U2's Bono read Norman Mailer's book, The Executioner's Song, based on Mailer's interviews with the killer, Gary Gilmore. Bono also read, like most of us have, the first and probably greatest true crime book ever written, In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, about the execution of the Cutter family back in 1959. And Bono had both books on his mind when he wrote the song, Exit, the last song on U2's huge 1987 album, The Joshua Tree. The song Exit is told from the mind of a killer. And there was something in it that even Bono found spooky. He once fell off the stage and broke his shoulder while playing the song live. And lying there at the foot of the stage, he asked himself what it meant that he had a song like this inside of him. 
and what it meant to inhabit that character on stage night after night. When Robert John Bardo heard you 2 song Exit though, there were no questions, just answers. Something in Robert clicked. Finally, he could relate. Robert saw himself as the song's protagonist, as the hero of the song. He listened to the song over and over again. And right around this time, Rebecca Schaefer, the former sitcom star and object of Robert John Bardo's obsession, was looking for ways to keep her acting career going. And like so many child actors, she wanted to shrug off the squeaky clean image of her earlier roles. And she took a part in a black comedy called Scenes from the Class Struggle that included a scene in bed with her co-star, nothing racy, but her part was a far cry from her previous squeaky clean sitcom character. My idea of taking a risk is losing my birth control pills or or shopping at sex without a sale. I want to live, but I don't know how. Robert saw the movie immediately upon its release, and he was horrified. And then he was enraged. How could Rebecca do this to him, he thought. In his mind, Rebecca Schaefer was her sitcom character, and she was in love with him. She basically told him so when she wrote him that letter, the one where she said Robert's letter to her was the nicest she'd ever received. But what was she doing? What was this betrayal all about, Robert thought. His old obsession reattached itself to Rebecca, but now it was different. It was no longer about possession. It was about destruction. If Robert couldn't have her, he'd destroy her. Robert John Bardo started making preparations. He hired a private investigator in Los Angeles. For $300, the private dick went down to the Department of Motor Vehicles and got Rebecca Schaefer's home address for Robert. The next thing Robert needed was a gun, so he got one from his brother. And now Robert needed advice, so he wrote to John Lennon's assassin, Mark David Chapman, in prison. And Robert wanted to know what prison was like. And finally, Robert needed inspiration. So Robert John Bardo listened to U2's exit over and over and over again. And so now, armed with Rebecca's address, a gun, and his copy of A Catcher in the Rye, Robert John Bardo boarded a bus to LA from Tucson. He had one CD in his disc man for the ride. You Too's The Joshua Tree. He listened to that one song and that one song only for the entire ride. You Too's The Exit. Robert made it to Rebecca's place and rang the doorbell. Rebecca answered. Robert explained who he was. He showed her the letter she'd written to him a while back, as if it explained everything. And Rebecca was annoyed, but she was polite. She signed a headshot for him and explained that she had to go. She shook Robert's hand and told him to take care. In Robert John Bardo's deranged mind, this was a great start. He walked to a nearby diner where he read his copy of The Catcher in the Rot and played the meeting back in his mind on repeat. And the more he thought about it, the more he realized that it hadn't gone as well as he had planned, as well as he had thought. She hadn't understood him and that it wasn't necessarily her fault because he failed to make her understand. He thought though that he could make her understand if she would just give him the time to play her U2's The Exit. If he could just play her this one song, she'd understand where he was coming from and what he had to do and why he had to do it. An hour later, Robert John Bardo arrived back on Rebecca Schaefer's doorstep. He rang the doorbell again and she answered and he told her he'd forgotten to give her something. He opened his bag, and there was her headshot, the book, the CD, and the gun. And there was nothing Bono could possibly say that his gun couldn't say better. So Robert left his copy of the Joshua Tree in his bag, and he pulled out that gun. And then he shot Rebecca Schaefer in her chest at point blank range. Robert then ran off, leaving Rebecca Schaefer bleeding out in her doorway. And when she was eventually found and brought to the nearest hospital, she was pronounced dead on arrival. The next day, cops in Tucson got reports about a guy walking through traffic on the interstate shouting, I killed Rebecca Schaefer, basically begging someone to run him over. It was, of course, Robert John Bardo. He was quickly arrested and sent to LA for trial. His lawyers entered a plea of insanity. And they waived a jury trial. They presented the judge with Robert's history of institutionalization. And they read letter after letter that he'd written to Rebecca Schaefer and they pointed to his copy of The Catcher in the Rye, the book which was the premier calling card for crazed shooters in the 1980s. Remember John Hinckley, who was carrying a copy of the same book when he shot Reagan? 
Well, a jury found Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity, so it stood to reason that another jury would find Robert not guilty by reason of insanity as well, or so his lawyers thought. And to further cement their case, Robert's attorneys had another piece of evidence, U2's song, Exit. The lawyers played the song in the courtroom as their concluding piece of evidence. Robert John Bardo, who'd been unresponsive through weeks of the trial, he lit up when the song found its way through the courthouse speakers. He drummed along to the song on his thighs. He lip-synced to Bono's lyrics. But the judge, the judge was not buying it. Maybe the defense's strategy seemed a little too close to John Hinckley's defense. Hinckley's lawyers had made the jury watch the Martin Scorsese film Taxi Driver in its entirety to demonstrate how the film had caused John Hinckley Jr.'s obsession with Jodie Foster and led to his attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan. But whatever the reason, the judge found Robert John Bardo guilty. In 1991, Bardo was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Rebecca Schaefer. When Bono read that his song allegedly inspired the murder, his first thought was that it sounded like a strategy by a defense attorney to get their client off. But he remembered the way he felt lying at the foot of the stage that one time with his shoulder broken while the band kept playing that song. The song Exit behind him. There was a darkness in that song. And now it had gotten out and it had gotten Rebecca Schaefer killed. You two pulled Exit from their live repertoire. They didn't play it again live until decades later in 2017 on the 30th anniversary tour for the Joshua Tree. At that time, Robert John Bardo was still rotting in a prison cell outside LA. But he's not the only one to use music as an excuse for murder. He wasn't even the first to do it in Los Angeles. But that's another story. And not a story you want to miss. So be sure to subscribe to this channel, turn on all notifications. If you enjoyed this video, like it, let me know in the comments. And if you remember when Apple randomly downloaded U2's album onto your iPhone back in 2014, uh, we can talk about that in the comments as well. If you want more of Disgraceland, check out our daily shorts here on this channel. And you can listen to the Disgraceland music and true crime podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. With episodes on Keith Richards trafficking heroin, Jerry Lee Lewis allegedly getting away with murdering his wife, Nipsey Hussle's murder, Kurt Cobain's suicide, Snoop, Taylor Swift, The Grateful Dead, Cardi B, and more. You can listen to the Disgraceland podcast for free wherever podcasts are available, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon Music, wherever. Check me out on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at DisgracelandPod. You can also text me or leave me a voicemail at 617-906-6638. See you next week in Disgraceland, Rockarola. Rock